Welcome back to this uh, uh, satellite that is entitled Emerging Paradigms in Precision Medicine for Lung Cancer. So uh, we, we have the privilege, uh, uh, we, uh, all of us, including uh, Dr. Pospos and myself, to have an outstanding faculty that uh, is represented by uh, Professor Luis Pazares from Madrid, Professor Egbert Smith from Amsterdam, Professor Jürgen Wolf from Cologne, and Professor Andrea Ardizzoni from Bologna. So there will be three formal, after the pre-session assessment, uh, there will be three formal presentations that will be followed by a general discussion and a round table discussion. At the end of the session, there will be a post-session uh, assessment before getting to the end, uh, before stepping into the afternoon agenda. Pete? Okay. Now we move on to the speaker. Professor Ores, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Giorgio. So what I'm going to try to address over the next uh, 20 minutes is about some changes in the uh, horizon, particularly related to the uh, precision medicine uh, treatment in the lung cancer field. For that, I will cover uh, some introduction on how is changing the field in terms of the knowledge we have about the molecular aberrations in lung cancer and the technology we have nowadays to try to target uh, those novel molecular abnormalities. Uh, some of the low frequency genomic drivers and treatments for that. Some other promising targets. We know that we have some particularly difficult subset of patients, subset of lung cancer, so that are really difficult to, to treat. And finally, some words on uh, uh, combination strategies. Here is hopefully the past. This is, I remember, when uh, uh, at the end of the uh, decade of uh, 1990s, we have uh, two or three new agents to combine with platinum. We didn't know what combination was the best, and this type of uh, uh, trials told us that uh, all treatments were not fantastic, none was better than any other, and the main uh, conclusion was that uh, median survival was eight months, uh, uh, regardless the treatment you were given. So hopefully, now we have kind of gathered a number of uh, uh, information that we have to use for our patients. Of course, we know a lot about the, norm, the uh, abnormalities uh, underlying lung cancer. You see here in this uh, profiling of the genomic uh, uh, abnormalities in lung cancer, you see uh, because uh, the exposure to uh, 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 cigarettes for a long time, typically our patients with adenos and squamous lung cancer, they do have a very high number of molecular abnormalities. Actually, it's among the highest compared with any other tumors. The good size of it is that we learn over the last decade a lot about of the new abnormalities. You see here uh, the typical uh, uh, mutation profiling in, in, uh, in uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma. We know that uh, some abnormalities that were there, we knew before, P53, P16, etc. but now we got more information about the actual uh, percentage. And we know about some other abnormalities that we didn't know before, for, for example, FGFR expression uh, uh, amplification that uh, uh, Jürgen will talk about. The same is true for adenos, different uh, abnormalities in smokers as compared to never smoker. And the important issue here is that if you look at, uh, 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 if you look at the, uh, uh, the slides, you realize that uh, for each abnormality, for each, let's say, signaling pathway that is uh, affected here, we know a number of uh, potential targeted therapies that can be of use. Of course, some of them are already in clinical trials or even in the practice. Many of them uh, are still to be investigated further on. 
The other important aspect is that uh, the technology nowadays will help us to really target more efficiently these molecular normalities. We got these small molecules, typically less than uh, uh, 5,000 daltos, that are pretty good. They are uh, orally uh, with good bioability uh, when given orally. They really have good penetration into the cell. We got these macromolecules, uh, monoclonal antibodies that are particularly specific. They only target the receptor we like to target, and we start to have some success, actually, with gene therapy. Uh, oligo, antisense oligonucleotides, anti-interfering uh, 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 microRNAs, etc. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, this is a trial we just published a couple of years ago uh, with a new interfering RNA against BEGF, and uh, of course we were able to get some responses. Technology is not quite there, so these type of drugs of constants tend to accumulate into the liver. Maybe this is the reason this patient with a liver uh, met had a, a, an eye response. But this is just to give you an idea that the technology is actually improving there, and we have many ways to deliver drugs in the, at the present time. OK. Low frequency genomic drivers. Of course, when you look at the typical genotyping tart, in, it's a bit different in the different parts of the world. In a way, uh, we know that here in Europe, about 10% uh, of our patients do have EFR mutation, about 3 to 4% do have uh, ALSA location. We know that we have uh, effective therapies in the clinical practice, in the daily practice for those patients. But still, there are some other patients that do have recognized molecular normalities, BRAF, HER2, PA3KA, of course, uh, KRAS. At the present time in the clinic, of course, we treat our patients with uh, uh, EFR mutation or ALK rearrangements with uh, specific uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors of the ALK kinase or the EFR kinase. And as you see on those pivotal trials, we are getting much better results, not only in PFS. We know that at the end of the day, those patients receiving it. Uh, targeted therapy do have uh, longer survival and, of course, better quality of life. Even better, we are starting to recognize the mechanism of resistance to those patients with this oncogen driven uh, tumors that are uh, targeted with a specific therapies uh, like EFR or RTKIs. We know the mechanism of resistance, and because of that, we were able to actually uh, d uh, deliver uh, uh, or start to develop some new drugs that are actually effective in this context. The typical example is the t 17 idm mutation, which is maybe responsible for progression, resistant progression in about 50 to 60 percent of EFR uh, 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 cases treated with gefitinib or elatinib. We got now a new a generation of inhibitors that actually is specific for the t 17 idm uh, uh, mutated kinase with nice response rate about 60 percent and nice uh, pfs about uh, median of uh, about 10 months in the last uh, uh, update with the clovis or the uh, astrazeneca uh, uh, compounds of course because they are not affecting so much the uh, wild type kinase uh, rash and diarrhea is not very present with these drugs. Same is to be said with the second generation TKIs uh, uh, inhibiting the alkinase. They are effective upon progression of quercetinib, about 60% response rate, 50% with nice uh, PFS, and I think this is quite a success. But still, as we said at the beginning, there are a number of other genomic anormalities which are frequent, but at uh, even a lower level. HER2 mutations, about 1%. Retrolocation, about 05 to 1%. A PA3K mutations, uh, uh, BRAF mutation, about uh, 1%, etc. And I think we need to have some data here. Indeed, 
we have some data. For example, we know that uh, ROS1 positive pacing, which is about 1 to 1.5 percent of the tumors, we know that they got a response rate, which is uh, about uh, 60 to 70 percent. Even more important, PFS is actually double than the one you're getting with ALK positive patients when treated with crisotinib, which is a very effective ROS inhibitor. Actually, there are many other drugs, some of them also inhibiting ALK that are very effective ROS inhibitor, and there are a number of trials also in this setting. BRAF is effectively targeted with uh, BRAF inhibitors. Response rate about 40%, and indeed there are some other trials already ongoing. You see some results at ASCO with the combination of BRAF inhibitor plus MEK1 inhibitors. But it's still also amplification. We know that MET inhibitors are not very good in the uh, uh, patients selected by expression, but we think that maybe amplification is a better way to select those patients. About, uh, uh, the, of course, the proportion of true amplification of MET is much lower, but maybe those patients are getting uh, the true response rate. FGFR uh, uh, aberrations are more frequent in squamous cell carcinoma, and Dr. Wolf will tell you uh, more about. The important issue here is that how are we going to manage those patients in the clinic, particularly how are we going to get drugs for this small, small percentage of patients? Do agencies, regulatory agencies, are going to need randomized trials? Those are really difficult to produce on patients that are, uh, 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 I mean, the, pro the population is so small that um, uh, having randomized trials here is going to be really difficult. It could be enough to show a response rate of 50%, let's say on the second line setting, where the typical response rate with chemo is 10%. How many patients you need? Would be historical controls enough? Maybe another alternative is also that we can say is do large screening platforms uh, within our countries at the European level and then having these basket trials where uh, uh, you can put your patients, maybe not all your, the patients in your center, but referring to some other centers for uh, the specific order of patients. So if you do a wide screening at your center, you could have maybe open a couple of trials for ROS positive patients, for red positive patients, but maybe your patient actually have a BRAF mutation, you can send it maybe to Milan here to a, a, a clinical trial with a, 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 a aberration at the BRAF uh, signaling. Promising targets, well, this is not uh, uh, something easy to choose. If I have to choose two or three, maybe one of them would be the hair uh, pathway. EGFR pathway is a lot more complex that we typically show on the reduced uh, uh, view pictures. And some of the things are important here are the HER2 pathway. I think uh, we got very good drugs, TM1, uh, pertuzumab, etc. So I think there, are, there is room for improvement here. Uh, then the same can be said with HER3 inhibitors, particularly the for patients with H3 high uh, 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 overexpression, I would say, or high expression. The other important maybe target are uh, chaperone inhibitors, heat shock potrionide inhibitors. They are very uh, important to maintain the function of uh, aberrant proteins like oncogenic drivers. Indeed, we have learned that particularly for our positive patients, they do have uh, particularly good activity. This is true with all the compounds that have been tested. And maybe in the future we can combine, let's say, ALK inhibitors with heat shock proteinide inhibitors in a way trying to prevent uh, the emergence of resistance, maybe. And of course, in many other uh, oncogenic driven tumors, uh, there is room for the, the employment of this type of uh, agents. 
The third type of uh, strategy I would choose as promising would be, of course, immune modulation. We know a lot about the, of the cycle of uh, uh, immune activation and fighting against tumor, and the, of course, a number of uh, agents are uh, uh, being explored in lung cancer, particularly anti-PD-1 and PD-L1 agents, and uh, the compound that uh, has uh, uh, been more in the field is nivolumab with, let's say, initial result quite promising, response rate about 20%, uh, particularly uh, important the two-year survival rate, about 40% in the phase one trial. Importantly, you know that a couple of weeks ago or days ago, the FDA have approved uh, this agent for the treatment of patients with squamous cell carcinoma. Of course, we still need to see the, the, the results of the phase three trial. Some other agents also have shown very important activity, not only in the second line setting, but also in the third line setting, like, such as the case for Pembrol uh, Sirumab. More importantly, we have to learn how to best combine this drug with chemo, radiation, targeted agents. We have to exploit the time when we are inducing apoptosis with targeted agent, with chemo, to maybe uh, 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 foster the immune system with this type of drugs. We have mainly talked here a bit about the use of anti-PD-1s and PD-L1s, but there are other type of immune uh, type of drug, immune modulators that can be used in combination, depending on, at the end of the day, of the uh, uh, scope or the photo of the tumor of the patient, depending on if there are immune activation or not, if there is expression or not of one inhibitor or not, etc. Like to talk two minutes on difficult subsets, and of course you know that possibly nowadays the more difficult one is KRAS mutant lung cancer. We know that about 30 to 40 percent of lung cancer do have some degree of activation of the pathway, and of course there are a number of uh, uh, strategies that can be used as shown here on the right uh, uh, part of the slide. Of course, different pathways can, uh, uh, can be inhibited. So far, the most promising data are with the MEK1 inhibitors. You see here the result. Actually, remember this curve to answer your question. Uh, the combination of the MEK inhibitor with Taxotere had given some promising results on this small phase two trial. The only thing is that uh, 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 the combination is not, is not an easy one, and I still think uh, there are room for improvement, and some other agents are being explored in this setting. One case is the, uh, uh, is, uh, the CDK46 inhibitor, for example. Actually, Another difficult subset is squamous cell carcinoma. I think this is an issue or a, an era, uh, a, a context where CDK4, CDK6 inhibitor may be relevant. At the present time, we have data uh, with uh, a couple or three of the compounds, such as the one from uh, Novartis, uh, Pfizer, or, or Lilly. And there are some xenograph data suggesting activity particularly when there is defects on the P16, functional defect, or uh, overexpression of cycling D, particularly maybe in some subsets such as lung cancer, a, a KRAS mutant also. Uh, some data is favoring this type of uh, strategy. You see here the results from the phase one trial with the Lilly compound showing particular activity in patients with KRAS mutation, and there are some preclinical studies, some biological plausibility for that, and there is a phase three trial actually ongoing in this patient population with this compound. Finally, because of the complexity of the molecular normalities in lung cancer, I think we have to learn a lot more about combining drugs particularly if many pathways are dysregulated in this disease. And we can do it several of different ways. One way, of course, for example, is inhibiting uh, uh, one pathway at the level of the receptor, 
of the receptor of the external domain, but also at the kinase of the cytoplasmatic kinase. And uh, one uh, good example for that is uh, the inhibition of uh, dual inhibition of EGFR at the external domain with a monoclonal antibody and with a TKI internally. Actually, there are some promising uh, uh, results uh, with the combo of a fatinib plus a uh, mm -hmm. which really reinforce uh, uh, that may be an effective way to go uh, in the erlotinib resistant uh, uh, setting. Another typical example is uh, this uh, combination of MEK inhibitors with PA3 inhibitors. When you inhibit the MEK pathway with a MEK inhibitor, actually you get in less phosphorylation of ERK. ERK is actually an inhibitor of RAS on a f with a feedback loop. In indeed, if you're inhibiting the ERK phosphorylation, actually, you're actually Prevent, not preventing the activation of the PA3K pathway through RAF. So a good combination here could be MEK inhibitor with uh, 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 the uh, uh, PA3K inhibitors. And this is what uh, we are trying to express here. Another way is to combine an inhibitor of a pathway like EGFR with uh, the inhibition of a uh, escape uh, pathway, for, for example, uh, MEC is like you having two pathway, two motorways. You not should close one. You should close two of them to really interrupt the vehicles to 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 circle. And uh, we have some good examples for that in phase two trials. This is the case of the EFR LRNA plus MEC inhibitors combination. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, unfortunately, it didn't work in phase three trials. And just to finalize, this is a paper from the Free University of uh, Amsterdam, from the NKIA of Amsterdam, showing that maybe a general mechanisms of progression to TKIs and chemo, such as the MET12, which is controlled through PDGFR, uh, TGF beta, may be an overall mechanism that we should actually include in the development of our uh, treatments for the future, preventing uh, resistance to happen. And that's all for today. Thank you very much. There is, a, <coughs> there is a question from the audience. What about the toxicity of a combined treatment, for instance, the combination of fatinib plus cetuximab? Well, I think that's uh, uh, a very relevant issue, and I think uh, we, have to, we have to learn uh, how to best combine drugs. Uh, toxicity is a main issue when combining drugs. This is true for combining MEK inhibitors with pha 3 k inhibitors or dual inhibition of uh, EGFR, for example, as saying here. To be honest, I don't think the combination of, let's say, afatinib plus cetuximab is going to make it. I think it's important as a proof of principle that we can use dual inhibition, uh, 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 but uh, one way, for example, I may wonder if you inhibit uh, using uh, a, a TKI that is not uh, producing so much RAS, such as the new selective t 17 atm inhibitors with cetuzumab, you're not improving the, the actual results without getting so much uh, toxicity. So, of course, this is something that we have to uh, take care of, I would say. Thank you so much for, for reason of time. We need to move to the second speaker. The second speaker is Professor Jürgen Wolf from Cologne, and his presentation will deal with the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma in the area of precision medicine. Okay, we move on to the next pres presenter, and af afterwards the panel discussion. The next speaker will be uh, my friend Egbert Smit, currently working in the Netherlands, Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam, and a little bit still in the Free University in Amsterdam. Egbert. Yes, thank you very much. Um, being third in line, uh, there's always a danger that your slides have already been shown, and uh, I'm not going to focus on the... Um, 
let's say, targets to come, but <coughs> focusing on what we have and uh, nowadays available and how we can tailor second-line treatment in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. So these are my disclosures. Tailoring uh, second-line uh, therapy in non-small cell lung cancer, there are quite uh, good guidelines available. Uh, for instance, the uh, latest version of the uh, ESMO guideline issued in 2014 states that second-line therapy should be offered to patients with good performance status who present with signs of disease progression after first-line therapy, irrespective of the administration of maintenance treatment. And then it goes on where it comes down to tailoring. Any patient with an EGFR mutation should receive an EGFR TKI as second line if not received previously, which is obvious based on the data that are available in the literature. And the same goes for patients with ELK rearrangements. I think the, one of the problems was the patients with undetermined or wild type EGFR status um, where the, the ESMO guideline states that elotinib presents a potential treatment option. <coughs> if one looks at what prognostic factors are in a second-line randomized trial, a, uh, mul <coughs> a multivariate analysis was presented a couple of years ago by uh, Di Maio and co-workers where you can see that there are a number of clinical factors that are to be taken into account. The most um, important ones are um, gender. Females always do better than males, also when it comes down to lung cancer, and performance status. And one can administer points to these, um, to these variates. Uh, for instance, if you're a female, you get a zero. If you have a uh, adenocarcinoma, zero, and uh, type of first-line therapy without platinum is also zero. And if you have a performance status of two, you will get seven points. If you then sum up all those points, you get a prognosis based on the clinical risk score. So this is also a form of tailoring treatment. We are physicians, so we have to take into account clinical, risk or, uh, clinical scores as well. So the best score is you have when you are is up to five points, and then your median survival exceeds 10 months in second-line treatment. So if you're a female, adenocarcinoma, no platinum-based therapy in first line, you can expect almost one year's median survival following first line, uh, progression of first-line treatment. Whereas if you have a performance status of two and you are male, your median survival is three months. And all of this is irrespective of treatment, okay, except for the EGFR mutated and ELK mutated patients. So how about the maintenance uh, therapy? In, uh, already in 2011, the uh, AS ASCO uh, update said that uh, limitations of these data, such as the break from cytotoxic therapy after a fixed course is also acceptable with and then in comes the important part with the initiation of second-line chemotherapy and disease progression. So this um, addresses the issue of whether we can stop chemotherapy. Uh, uh, Louise will uh, say that in patients with adenocarcinoma who have not progressed, you should, uh, on a pemetrexate based regimen, you should administer pemetrexate. But the ASCO uh, in 2011 already stated that there are also alternative um, treatment strategies. A somewhat older study that does not address all the issues, uh, that does not address the uh, situation today, was a uh, French uh, study, but I think it really uh, hits an important point. So the study was designed that patients uh, would have platinum-based chemotherapy in first line, and then be randomized to a maintenance treatment or observation only. And at disease progression, all patients should receive second-line therapy. So it addresses the question that was asked by the ESCO, is it acceptable to have a treatment break provided you are willing to administer second-line therapies? And these are the results published 
almost three years ago now, but there is really no difference between maintenance therapies provided you are willing to administer second-line therapies. So which chemo should we then give for second line? These are the three, uh, I think, main uh, trials. The first one, the trial uh, headed by Francis Shepherd, that uh, f was the first one that identified an active regimen, docetaxel, uh, over uh, observation only. And then there were two trials that compared docetaxel with an uh, investigational agent, one being uh, pemetrexid and the other one being topotecan. So these are really are the three trials that are um, designed uh, for second-line therapies. Or should we administer each of our TKIs? There are two randomized phase three trials, large trials, that actually there was no difference in overall survival between treatment and second-line in patients treated with each of our TKIs or chemotherapy. So you would be inclined to think that each of our TKIs are the ones to be preferred since they have less toxicity, more easy to administer. Is that true? Well, there are three recent phase three studies on the role of each of our TKIs in second line uh, treatment. Two of these trials actually performed here in uh, Northern Italy, the Taylor study and the PRO study, and there are data from Japan uh, the, uh, which is called the DELTA study. So the Taylor study was a study that specifically looked at patients with each of our wild types, so all these patients were genotyped, and only patients with a wild type each of our were randomized between daily allotinib at a standard dose, 150 milligrams, or standard docetaxel, and you know uh, the results that PFS was increased in patients that were treated with chemotherapy, and OS was also increased in patients with treated with chemotherapy. So it seems that for patients with wild-type EGFR, chemotherapy is to be preferred over EGFR TKIs. However, we know that there is a, uh, these data were, uh, were um, let's say, confirmed in a Japanese study where they looked uh, at patients with EGFR wild-type treated with either the same elotinib or docetaxel, and you can see from these curves that patients who treated with docetaxel fared better. But there are some patients with each of our wild type that seems to do well after treatment with each of our TKIs. And there is a proteomic test, it's called Veristat, that's available nowadays in the United States, as it was mentioned in the NCCN guidelines approximately uh, uh, four months ago. Uh, it's a, uh, you take a, a tube of blood, look at the, um, look at the expression of uh, six proteins, and you can identify patients who are ferristat good or are ferristat bad. Typical American test, either you're a good guy or you're a bad guy or a good woman or a bad woman. So these are the results. You can see here four curves. The upper two curves are patients with ferris who are ferristat good, treated with either chemotherapy, the red line, or a lot in it, the blue line. So you can see here that patients with a ferristat good proteomic profile do good with a lot in it, or chemotherapy mm -hmm. equally well, whereas patients who are ferristat bad fare better with chemotherapy as compared to elotinib. So there is a group of patients that can be identified through a simple test, second line, each of wild type, that do well with each of our tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I think that the implications of these three recent trials are that for each of our wild type or each of our undetermined patients, chemotherapy is the standard of care in second line, and for patients with good prognostic scores, each of our TKI is a treatment option in second line, if you can do the test. So the novel agents have been discussed by the previous two speakers, and I will touch briefly on them. First, uh, there's a comeback of the angiogenesis inhibitors in second line, the small molecule inhibitor nintedanib and the mono monoclonal antibody, remosirumab. 
and um, I have been long time, uh, long time I have been a skeptic about the uh, possibilities of immune modulating agents, but I have to admit that some of these agents do have activity in second line non small cell lung cancer, in particular squamous cell cancer. So these are the characteristics of nintendinib. It's a oral agent, a small molecule inhibitor of the VEGF and other receptors uh, involved in the uh, neoangiogenesis. The pivotal study was a LUMLUNG1 study where patients received either docetaxel or docetaxel and nintendinib. You can see here no tailoring of treatment here. These were unselected patients after first-line platinum-based chemotherapy, all histologies, and whether or not treated with uh, bevacizumab did not matter. So the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and there is a 0.7-month difference. In the overall population, there was no survival difference, but if you select patients with adenocarcinoma, in particular those that did well after first-line treatment, there was a uh, two, more than two-month difference and statistically significant difference in a pre-specified uh, analysis for those patients with adenocarcinoma treated with nintendinib uh, in addition to docetaxel as compared to placebo and docetaxel. You've seen this study, again, no selection of patients, and it was also not possible to identify subgroups that benefited well from this, um, from this monoclonal antibody directed against VEGF. And you can see here the survival curves, a 1.5-month survival difference in, at the median in progression-free survival, and there was the same difference in overall survival. So there is a, a modest survival benefit of these new angiogenesis, angiogenesis inhibitors, which really poses the question whether this is clinically relevant. And um, if there is a biomarker, we urgently need one to select patients that benefit most from this treatment. So immunotherapy, uh, the basis of immunotherapy, as you know, is immune escape. And there is a... Uh, there are two possible markers. I, um, I think at least that was the uh, simplistic uh, way of thinking and where everybody nowadays looks at or investigates the PD-1 or PD-L1. But as you can appreciate from this slide, there are a lot, really a lot, potential markers that need to be investigated in order to identify uh, patients that will um, benefit from uh, cancer immunomodulation therapy. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the other forms of uh, immunotherapy. These are the survival curves of the PD-1 um, nivolumab um, antibody. Uh, I was surprised that Jürgen could show you the uh, survival curves. I looked for them. I only saw the figures, but not the curve. And I think a three-month improvement in uh, overall survival in second line non-small cell lung cancer is unheard of as yet, and I think this agent really has future in uh, non-small cell lung cancer and will be available, uh, as I uh, understand from um, representatives of bristol Myers script through uh, compassionate use programs in Europe uh, somewhere halfway this year. There are more monoclonal uh, antibodies against pd one that have uh, activity. You can see here one... Uh, unpronounceable, but a 23% response rate in 53 patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But you can also see that histology did not matter much, and that this uh, compound has similar activity in patients with non-squamous as compared to squamous cell carcinomas, which is actually true for most of these um, agents, immunomodulating uh, agents, agents that are tested today in phase one and two studies, and even three studies. Uh, you can see here some of the challenges we have with um, pdl one staining. There are some factors associated with pdl one expression, like clinical factors, older patients, men smokers, those with squamous and more advanced stage disease. And um, in patients, uh, PD in those patients, it may be a negative uh, prognostic uh, factor. 
you can see here the um, influence of the uh, staining of the percentage of uh, uh, tumor cells stained uh, as with respect to survival following treatment with pembrolizumab and also with the Roche compound. And, um, I will skip this one because this has been showed already, but I think this is something that we need to reflect on. If we, there are a number of monoclonal antibodies, there are a number of cutoffs that are defined. Uh, nobody knows how this is actually being done. Uh, and how do we uh, define a threshold for positivity or negativity when that is important? What I really think is that we need, still need clinical trials in second line uh, non small cell lung cancer. The percentage of patients that can expect long term survival in second line actually is very, very small, and we still need trials to. Uh, define those patients and those drugs that will work together best. So single agent chemotherapy as a conclusion is still standard in second line therapy. We don't have good measures to select for specific agents. Each of our mutations and L rearrangements are the sole reliable biomarkers for treatment selection nowadays. There's some comeback of angiogenesis inhibitors Despite my thinking, your immunotherapy is here to stay, but still there's no reliable biomarker, and we still should consider enrollment of patients into clinical trials. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Edward. Um, I'd like to invite the speakers now to the podium, to the panel discussion. So the title of the roundtable is Cost Effectiveness of Targeted Therapies of that uh, is a critical issue, especially in the long term, in view of the, of the average cost of the targeted therapies, especially in a, in a European context where the public healthcare system is driven by, by different rules compared to the uh, US healthcare system. Uh, in addition to that, if there are specific questions to each of the speakers, uh, you can uh, you can stand up, go to the to the microphone, identify yourself, and making questions. So coming coming back to the to the title of the roundtable discussion, I would like to ask to the to Dr. Arrizzoni. Uh, well, we are used to see, uh, we, to deal with these targeted therapies, and we are looking to the efficacy side. We are not taking care too much of the toxicity that we are generating sometime with these uh, new targeted therapies uh, in, a, in a broad way. Do you have any comment on that? I think that the, um, we have several parameters to, to, uh, to check for efficacy. We usually, for simplicity, look at the median survival difference, but this is only a part of it because these curves are so-called banana curves that somehow have a shape that uh, you are looking at part of the curve, you are not looking to overall curve. So I think, to me, what is most important is to look at the percentage of patients that have some long-term effect. So both, for example, in the, in the Ramusirum trial, you see that there is a percentage of patients having a long-term <coughs> effect. So I think, as a clinician, I would be much more interested in looking at this to decide whether the treatment is worthwhile and whether the cost is justified. So one thing is thinking of a 1.4 1.5 median survival benefit. One thing is looking at 20% of patients being surviving at one year or two years, etc. So I think that we should look at this type of effect in a different way and also in terms of cost, probably. And also to explain to the patient the treatment uh, is something that we should consider a different way rather than the median uh, addition of effect, which is not very important for the single patient. I don't know if I answered your question, yeah. George. Uh, Jorge, any thought? 
Jürgen, any thought from your side? Mm. I, I completely agree that the meeting over all survival is not relevant for the patient sitting in front of me. But on the other hand, uh, the problem, especially with this trial and these drugs with such a small difference, is a selection. So because on the other hand, you have a few patients with benefit, but on the other hand, you have the majority, the overhelving majority of patients who are treated without any, any benefit. And I think this is the other side of the coin, which also has to be considered. So in fact, uh, the interesting thing would be to be able to identify what are the driver of those 20% having the benefit, which is obviously the, the big challenge to us at the moment. We don't have an answer, actually. And, and to add a provocative comment to both stories, the EGF receptor antibodies and the VEGF receptor uh, trials, it, it, it does not seem as if we will have such biomarkers within the next 20 years because we, did not, we were not able to identify such biomarkers within the past 30 years in the whole field, for instance, of angiogenesis. And so I'm, I'm not optimistic. Yeah, regarding this um, um, aspect of biomarkers and the statement by Egbert that uh, single-agent therapy is still the standard of care for second line, um, what's the opinion of the, of the panel about the, the newer combinations? For instance, an intadenib in combination with docetaxel. It has registration only for the combination with docetaxel. So how, how should clinicians deal with that? Uh, frankly, I, I do not know the answer. Um, I think that uh, two months difference and a hazard ratio that uh, I, I'm not really going to 0.8, I think is clinically relevant. And there is a case, I think, for a combination of nintedinib and docetaxel in, patient, in adenocarcinoma patients that relapse from treatment. Um, having said that, um, I'm, I'm aware that uh, a lot of patients will be treated without any benefit. And then the, um, you have to make a balance between side effects of treatment, and I think costs are also a side effect of treatment, at least from a society uh, perspective and the uh, potential benefits. And if you explain to your patients that on average there is a, uh, a benefit and on average the side effects do weigh against this uh, benefit, uh, I think it's, it's a, a matter of discussion for the, uh, with these patients. Mm. So I'm not very enthusiastic of, uh, with uh, therapies based on these hazard ratios of 0.85, and I think we should invest more brain money and efforts in identification of second-line patients who have the option of an effective targeted treatment. For instance, we can look for the BRAF mutations, for the HER2 uh, mutations and aberrations. We have the ROS, the RET, and uh, now also the MET amplifications. This is a substantial proportion of patients where, based on the low efficacy rates of chemotherapy in the second line setting, in my opinion, is absolutely justified, or, or maybe it's even a must to treat these patients in a personalized fashion and to, to negotiate with the health insurance companies to take over the costs for this. Okay, so um, one thing to say against that is, what was the hazard ratio of chemotherapy over nothing? Over nothing? Point no, point it was eight. It's something like point, point eight. Eight five. Point eight five. Okay? So chemotherapy, in your view, or let's say in the view of the proponents of uh, um, targeted therapies, is not worthwhile um, to be provocative. I know you think different on that. Issue. Sure, I, I do agree with you that um, if we can identify a target, a drugable target, 
and we do have the assurance companies on our side, which I, at least in my country, is not something that is easy. Um, I think a targeted agent, for instance, um, femorafenib or dabrafenib in a v BRAF V600E patient is totally justified and was, would be the first thing that we should do. But the larger proportion of patients, even the larger proportion of adenocarcinoma patients, do not have druggable targets as of today. More, many, many of the things that we show actually is something, is a form of wishful thinking in that these drugs with these numbers and letters do work in these targets, and which is by no means for the treatment of patients today. So just to endorse a little bit what, uh, this is a question for everyone in the panel, okay? So, uh, and this is related to the, 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 the real key issue for me that is the long-term sustainability of the market, okay? So imagine to have two patients in your clinic. Or, uh, for one of these two patients, for both patients you have a standard of care available. For one of these agents, uh, for one of these patients, you have a new targeted therapy that is improving the PFS uh, of three times, okay? And the, 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 the total cost of the therapy is 50,000 euros. On the other side, you have a standard of care available for the other patient. And you have a new treatment that the average cost for everyone in a totally or partially selected population based on clinical factors. And the total cost of the treatment is 15,000 euros. And you need to offer this kind of treatment for all these type of patients. What is your choice in, in patient one and patient two? Because this is the real critical point in the near future. So you have the standard of care available for each of, of, of the two patients. But you have new treatment options for one that is based on a biomarker driven type of treatment. The other one is a relatively, let's say, based on lousy and clinical enrichment criteria. Egbert. Difficult question. Are you start for <laughs> No, but this is true, I mean, because it's, it's coming back to your question. Yes. Well, I think it's a dilemma that cannot be solved on this side of the table. Okay? Um, Politics. It's, in the end, it's a, a question of how much are we, what, what part of the national budget are you willing to spend on health care? So, no, the, the, on, it's, the question is more ethical because the question is yes, coming so back I, every... I come, to, I come to that. The ethical point is here, do I help one or do I help two patients? Two. Uh, well, uh, there are a couple of things. I mean, for example, you look at um, the survival curves uh, in cancer in Europe, mm, there are some differences in between the different countries, and I would say Spain, for example, is one of is very much in the the in the good standard. I would say rate. If you look at the cost rate of the healthcare in Spain, is lower than in our countries. And, uh, but the, uh, the, the, the availability of drugs is pretty good, even our economical situation mm -hmm. is not good. Yeah? The reason for that is because doctors are paid very low. So at the end of the day, what happened is that, uh, because what the politicians look at is the overall cost, <coughs> This is the reason why, let's say, the access to new drugs is not that is reasonable, let's say, in Spain. So at the end of the day, the main question is not about the budget 
of a specific basis, but about how much money are you going to put on healthcare as compared to how much money are you putting on, let's say, motorways or any other business. And uh, this is important because if you, do, if you go and look at the pools in your society, what the in citizens like first is health, <coughs> is being health. So maybe we should try to, you know, like remember them that at the time of voting, they take the, that into account. Because it shouldn't be you and me and Giorgio decided in the clinic who is the patient benefiting because of a money thing. I mean, you know, it's, 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 which doesn't mean that should be everything for everyone, but within reasonable numbers, it should be like that. Okay. But Giorgio? Yeah. <laughs> but Giorgio has asked for a concrete clinical situation, and I think we have to differentiate strictly between two scenarios. One scenario is I'm sitting in a regulatory committee elaborating recommendations for the government or for the health insurance companies. Then it makes sense to, to think about these issues, but the other situation is I'm a doctor and a patient is sitting in front of me. Then I must treat him with the best therapy available regardless of the costs. These are totally different scenarios and, and though I think it's frustrating that we have now, especially in the second line setting, thousands of patients because lung cancer is a frequent disease which have, which carry targetable mutations and which are not treated in, treated in an optimal way. And I think this needs a joint effort with the patient advocacy groups, with the health insurance companies and so on. And, and I think it's better to invest time and brain and money here instead of developing drugs with a median overall survival benefit of four to six weeks. Can I just one minute? Okay, so the last comment. Uh, not just uh, if you allow me to do a, a, a small survey because I, I think we need to be uh, on the floor. I mean, we are talking about precision medicine and if you have a patient with a NER2 amplified lung cancer, who would be able today to deliver trastuzumab or pertuzumab to that patient? Please raise your hands. So, few. so this is the reality today. So we are doing a lot of molecular profiling, finding targets and not be able actually to treat our patients. So then we can close the session, thanks to, to the sponsor, uh, Lilly Oncology. Thanks to the people from iMedx for making this possible. And uh, above all, thanks to the speakers to participate in this session, to give their lectures and participate in the discussion.